Hello, Internet. We are back. And I'm excited, I can tell you. I just said to a fellow here in front of me, he's a Brian Hamilton Hall. He can speak Afrikaans too. I'm sure he can say a few words, but we're going to speak English. I said to him, you know what? I, I would really love to hear your story because he was in two signals, I think a regiment or something, and they were based at Mpacha. Mpacha, all of you know, is where the Caprivi was a major uh, Air Force runway, and uh, it served quite a, a, a large area of, of a border war. And they were there because we were intercepting signals. In other words, electronic warfare. That's what they were busy with. And I can tell you, I'm excited about this because it's a part of legacy we don't know about yet. And so I want to invite all these mates as well, guys, if you're listening here, uh, please come and talk to us. Come and tell your story. All of, all of you are welcome. And let me say to all the viewers, and I know you're busy. I know there's millions of views out in YouTube and wherever. So thank you for coming to Legacy. We appreciate you. Thank you for that, for your time. Now, Mr. Brian, what happened? Did the army grab you? Did Magnus Malanela sent you a letter and uh, you had to sign up and they grabbed you there? Tell us the story. Okay. The usual, the usual happened when we were in the school, at school, and uh, we got a call up. And uh, I think the army tried to put you into uh, into uh, units that you were that you were more or less going to be skilled in, like I think the uh, mechanics or into tiffies and things like that. So they first sent me to PDK, which is a personal dean school in Port Aka And then what happens is there was one thousand five hundred people called up to this base. Then they asked for volunteers to go to Heidelberg signals, and. Uh, we volunteered and off we went to uh, Heidelberg. Just about five kilometers outside Heidelberg is a, is a, a, a base camp. Uh, we used to call it BFAC. We did our basics there. After that, uh, there also volunteers for two signal regiment, which was in Fort Akawurta. I went through to Fort Akawurta. There, what we did is we they taught us uh, everything about radio, wavelengths, and they also taught us Morse code. And the phonetic alphabet. And after six six uh, six weeks of being at uh, in Kurtak Wurta, um, they picked six of us and we got seconded to Mapacha. So this uh, this was uh, the end of May. They gave us our seven day pass. We went and did seven day pass, and six of us climbed onto the Flossie at Wartelwurf. And uh, we flew up to uh, Mapacha. Myself, Marco Baroni, Gavin Hendricks, and uh, three other guys. And um, we landed at Mapacha. They picked us up, took us to, to, to the signal camp. And uh, there we did our roofy ship, two weeks of roofy ship. They, all it meant was very little sleep and kept monitoring these radios. So what happened was there's about it was about 15 radios monitoring the um, the Zambian frequencies and Swapo. So Mapacha was uh, it was two three six troop, uh, just a suit for brush bush reconnaissance unit for signal headquarters. That's what that's what we stood it stood for, and. Uh, it was split into five five little sections. One was DF, which was direction finding. So what happens is direction finding picks up where the signal is coming from, and we can draw a line to where this base camp is or whatever. And uh, there was a, a search unit that was searching all the radio frequencies for uh, for new for new uh, radio stations. Then it was fixed. Which was if they, if they picked up a, a radio station that they thought was important, they moved it across to the fixed guys, and they would monitor those frequencies. And then there was a uh, back shackle, which uh, all the important messages that we had, we would uh, type it up on a telex mes ma machine, and send it back to to South Africa to book an old slough. And uh, so what happened is uh, the DF the, the DF was quite an interesting division. What happened is in the, in the, in 1979, uh, Rhodesia was still there, so they had a base in Salisbury, and we would uh, they would if they picked up a signal, they would contact the Salisbury guys, 
and they would also draw a, a line. We draw a line, and we'd know exactly where this base camp was or these camps were. Uh, later on, they opened up another base at Amiga, which was uh, about 150 kilometers west of us. And three guys got seconded to there. What happened was you worked four hour shifts. So you, you were on for four hours every day, every single day, four hours. And then you, you once you've done your shift, they didn't really worry about you. You could do, lie around and do whatever. But you had to do this. And um, a lot of the stuff was Morse code. So Sarko all sent everything in Morse code. A lot of things in Zambia was also Morse code. Uh, Zamb Zambian police guys that monitored the Zambian police. In those days, they, everything got transmitted to the head office, all their cases. And these guys would get like 3,000 messages a, a month, all in Morse code. Every guy monitored two different radio stations. It was uh, uh, one on the left, one on the right. So you had a headphones. And this, the right hand one would be connected to a phone, uh, to a radio. The left hand one would be connected to another radio. And as the messages came through, we had a big tape recorder in front of us. As the message started, we'd hit the tape recorder. So in case we missed anything, we'd write the message down, or in Morse code or in in voice. Uh, and at the end, we'd we'd go and hand it all in, and then they would determine whether it's an important enough message to send back to Johannesburg or to to Buchanan's Cliff or not. So it was it was very interesting. My 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 stations I monitored was um, Zambian Air Force and Zambian Police. No, not Zambian Police. Zambian uh, Zambian National Regiment One, ZNR One. That's what I did. Um, but uh, so a, a couple of times we'd have uh, we'd pick up a signal, get hold of Salisbury. The one time I remember there was a uh, we picked up uh, one of the uh, frequencies and the Rhodesian Air Force went out, bombed the guys. They moved five k's to the right, transmitted again. They picked it up again, bombed them again. The third time they said no. Yeah, something funny happening here. They've got a traitor amongst them because wherever they're moving, the airplanes are bombing them. So uh, it, was, it, was quite, it was quite a funny story. We also used to uh, get these messages that were encrypted or they caught, thought they were encrypted where they swapped the letters around, to, uh, which was quite easy to break because what happened is they, they'd swap like the A and the Z and the, or the B and the C and, the, you know, they'd swap it all around. And uh, quite easily, they, you, you'd break that thing in five minutes because you'd have the, the, they'd actually have a reference number on top that they've also encrypted. So there's already six letters. And uh, so we, we did that whole big uh, breaking up of this uh, decoding of that. Zambia did have a, a, another one called ZNL, that we, which we never did. We wrote it down and sent it to, to, down to South Africa. I think they might have de uh, decoded it. We could never do, do it up there in, in Mapacha. Uh, oh, what happens? We on, on on Saturdays, basically the guys that weren't working, we'd have a we there'd be a movie a movie house in the center of Mapacha, so we'd go and watch these movies. And um, on the in, in 1970 1978, there was a, a bombing at Katima, is that that took out 10, 10 South African soldiers. We were there in 1979, a year a year after that. And we picked up some signals that um, they want the shop were going to have a reunion in Sheshaki. Sheshaki is now just across the road from uh, across the river from Apacha, uh, from Katima. And uh, Katima was 25 kilometers from Apacha. So we picked up that the shop was going to, they were going to have this reunion. So we were all a bit nervous. That, you know, it, 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 the whole base got to red alert because we were expecting some something happening. And that night we were busy watching the, uh, uh, a movie and suddenly a rocket came over the camp and landed at the airport. Uh, later on, somebody said it took out the tower, but I don't think it did. I, I, I just heard a big bang there. And we all ran straight for the, uh, straight for the uh, trenches. Because every, uh, around the camp was a lot of uh, trenches. Jumped in the trenches within half an hour Cars were driving around, couldn't understand what was happening. Actually, what it ended up being was one of our own um, naughty cars had shot in the wrong direction and the rocket came over Mapacha. 
Now, if that thing had landed like 200 meters short or 100 meters short, it would have taken out at least 50 of us. So it was, it was one of those scary uh, incidences. Uh, well, we, most of it was all Morse code. I know we, we, got, we got a guy by the name of Chris Gobel who monitored uh, also some of the sample frequencies. And after, after Operation Smoke Shell, he had to uh, do a, a, an inventory of how many swappers were, were killed and all that sort of stuff, the swapper losses. So he, that was part of their, their, their tasks. Every three weeks, we'd have, a, we'd have to do a night shift because the, the, we work six to six. And in the evening from six o'clock to 12 o'clock, you'd have a, a six hour shift. We had to monitor all the radios. So you put them all on like loudspeaker and you'd sit in, the, in this room where you got all these 15 radios. And as soon as uh, you picked up uh, a message was coming through on one of the radios, you just walk up to it and you'd hit the tape recorder. In the morning, whoever was in charge of that radio would go and um, listen to it back from the tape, write down the message and hand it in. So it was pretty interesting. Um, I saw, I actually saw, there, there was a, we had a base in, uh, in Grootfontein. All the Portuguese guys obviously got seconded to Grootfontein because they monitored the Angolan frequencies. So um, I saw on one of the legacy programs, I think it was Savati, where they actually did, picked up that there was a, a popular, um, we're going to move armaments from one camp to the other camp. After they detected it, and the Luti went, went and set up a, a, a trap and, they, and they, sh they shot up that whole, that whole um, and I was wondering after when I was watching the legacy, I thought, I wonder if it wasn't the Grootmantan guys that, uh, that actually picked that up. Was that, that was basically what we, what we had to do. After 1980, uh, Rhodesia or Zimbabwe now fell away. So our DFs only worked between Amiga base and uh, Mapacha. So we would uh, pick up some signals and then they would DF where, they, where, this, where, this, thing, where this message is coming from. I know, that, I know we got to one stage where we were trying to pick up a, a station that didn't, that was sending, transmitting so, so seldom and so short, such short messages that we couldn't actually pick up the, 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 the DF. So what happened is one of our guys got into a little Morse code machine sent them a message and they came back and said, who's on our way? Who's on our radio wavelength? And then that's how we, we actually DF them. And uh, so it was, it was, it was pretty interesting. And in, in 1980, um, there was an option to Western Zambia. And I'm not, I haven't picked that up anywhere yet, but there was an option to Western Zambia. And uh, we, I was still sitting at the radio when they all came and shouted, hey, come have a look, come have a look what you helped us do. And we got out there and they tend to dead swap a terrorist on the back of a truck. So they said, ah, thanks guys, this is what you people all helped. I think it was just like a, a morale booster for everybody. I don't think we specifically helped them do this, but I think they took the, these 10 terrorists around to all the people in, the, in, the, in Mapacha. Uh, other than that, we used to... Uh, Saturdays have briars most of the time. We were big into sport because uh, after you finished your four-hour shift, especially if you and you, if you worked a six to ten or the ten to two in the, in the uh, ten to two shift, the afternoons you were off. So we ended up most days playing either touch rugby or volleyball or soccer. We had an excellent soccer side. We played against all the sides around there. And it was it was it was quite lucky. It was a, it wasn't a, a heavy like a ops camp. So and it was it was very secretive. So nobody was allowed in the in this in this uh, signal camp. And everyone used to ask us what 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 goes on there. And I said no, we're just sending messages to to the states. We're not doing we're not actually doing anything because we were sworn to secrecy. You know, it was like a high top secret base in the in the middle of Mapacha. So. It was, it was really interesting. And, I mean, we monitored, the, all these radios monitored most of the, the Zambian army uh, regiments so it, and the Zambian police. Uh, I know the Zambian police doesn't sound like much because they're sending their case numbers in and things like that. But um, 
they just had to do it because in case they picked up any troop movements and things and, and that sort of thing. So after my two years, after my two years, I uh, got seconded to Regiment Northern Natal in infantry. And yo, so that was a bit of a wake up call because we actually had, we went into TVs and I walked patrol on the Mozambican border, totally new for me. So, and uh, after that, they sent me to Rundu the, for a three month camp. We did, I did four camps all in all. So we sent to Rundu and over there, they made me an 81 millimeter mortarist. So uh, went to the training base there near um, Itosha in, um, I can't remember the name now. Uh, we, we did about two weeks of training, refreshers course, taught me how to do the, do the 81 millimeter mortarist. And then we got sent to Rundu and about 25 k from Amoni, we set up our base there. I was in the head office, uh, in the head, uh, head, head, head headquarters, and the guys just went for their patrols, and I was the 81 millimeter mortars, number one mortars at uh, at this base in Amoni. They were just 20 k's from Amoni, not not at Amoni. That's why, I, when I see this legacy and all these three two battalions come back to Amoni, and we and all that, it was I, I understand where all this is, although I wasn't really involved with with 32 battalion. We also used to get movies up at Mapacha. Uh, they used to send us uh, with a Flossie every Wednesday. Every Wednesday, Flossie would come up. It would bring um, some movies to us. And then um, four doppies, the, the, the Rekis, would come pick up a, a movie for themselves. So some of the movies, take it to them, and the next week, bring it back to us. So we know they were further down the Caprivi somewhere at Buffalo. Or I don't think it's Buffalo with that town. Yeah. Yeah, that was, uh, that was it, Chris. Well, you know, I have a lot of questions. If you don't mind, I would love to, to ask you a few things here. With an eye on history, because, you know, there's a lot of children, so I call them, but they're not really children. Uh, but they don't know. They haven't been part of that era. So, so the first thing I want to ask you is, when you mentioned the word PDK Corps, Mm. Wasn't those yeah. the guys who were actually portrayed in Booty Gone Baller to in those movies? And I don't know yeah. what's the answer. So if, if you know, was it them? That, yeah, I, I think it was. Yeah, they like orange, like uh, pumpkin, pumpkin color berets or something like personal services corps. That's, I think that's the English word for it. Eh? First, I think they did all the admin and that sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah no, I think they had like a pink beret, but you know. I'm wearing a pink shirt, so let me rather keep quiet here. Uh, yeah, but I think they were part of this pretty humble too. And this is quite funny to me because when I became an attorney, one of my very first clients actually bought that house, that huge mansion thing, and was living in it and running his business from it. And so I got to that house quite often, and I would stand there and think, whoa, this is where we made that movie. Anyway, pretty mm -hmm. humble too. For those of people who don't know, it's, it's utter crap. Um, yeah. Very, very propaganda. We were two of them, I believe. Mm -hmm. I can't even remember the actors. Arnold something. Fossler. Arnold mm -hmm. Fossler. Anyway. Yeah. So if Arnold Fossler is listening, yeah, yeah, you can come and talk to us. We, we, would, we would accommodate you. But tell me, what is the weather like in, in Mapacha? The weather? Yeah, is it warm or cold? Uh, it was excellent. You know what happened? Boys, we were the first guys up at Mapacha. They gave us a choice of in this in the in the signal camp where to stay, and uh, they had like prefab buildings where all the people stayed, and they had two tents outside. And we volunteered straight away, myself and Gavin. We said straight away, we're going to the tents. We're not we don't want to be in this prefab building. So for eighteen months, we based we were based in the tents, and uh, the flaps were down all the time. It was excellent, I must say. I wanted to tell you, I took, uh, there's that movie, Midway, Battle of Midway, uh, and uh, I took my grandson there the other day, and uh, in that, in the Battle of Midway, how they detected where the Japanese fleet was, and, and they picked up all the signals, was exactly what we did, is they monitored the, Zapia, the, uh, the Japanese frequencies, and they actually picked up, that's how the Battle of Midway, that's, that's how they went, and I told my grandson, 
That's exactly what I did in the army. Yeah, that must have felt good because um, it's triangulation. It's all it is. If you have different and they transmit, that's why they got to Pearl Harbor almost on scene. The yeah, Japanese yeah, people yeah. before went away. That's how they yeah, so them we, we, had, we, had, we used to have a big map of uh, Western Zambia, basically, and uh, Eastern Angola. Because that's the area that we monitored. And uh, when they started, uh, when they sent a signal and the DF picked up the direction, they would go and draw this, uh, we had like a, a pin with a string in it, and we'd actually draw it, and we'd go to Amiga base, pinpoint it exactly where this base is in, in, in that part of the country. Now, we're speaking to some Special Forces people the other day, and they told me that the current Special Forces guys have stopped using their GPSs, phones, anything. <clears throat> anything we can transmit because we're Americans, apparently. So they tell me we're intercepting this new way they were, and they actually want the enemy. Uh, this happened somewhere in Africa. And since then, they just refuse. They stay back on the compass and whatever. They just don't transmit. But that 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 is fascinating to me because we were taught uh, very much about uh, radio security all the time. Uh, were you guys also taught that on the South African side that guys don't chatter on the box, don't, you know, don't play the fool there? You know, we, we were on the other side. We never, we, you know, the, the army probably would have, would have had radio silence, and now you understand why. Because uh, we were on the other side. We were on the monitoring side. So the only, only communication we had with the outside world was our back shackle that would send a telex down to South Africa transmitting the messages. So we wouldn't we 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 didn't have radio silence, but obviously I think uh, the swappers and the poppers would have radio silence certain at certain times because and now you understand why. Yeah, we just recorded the uh, Ox Amazon videos. It's a series of free videos, it's about seven hours, where special forces talk about the attack on the Bitu Harbor in 1980, 10th of mm. August. And would you believe during that entire attack where they went in and destroyed three different targets, they haven't used their radios once. From the moment that they left the strike craft, went in, did the ops, came back out, not once that they used their radios. And they're very proud of that. Just amazing. Well, There's no way you would have intercepted them. You just couldn't. Yeah. And, 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 and I, all they did is I said, listen, by that day, that time, I will be there and that sort of thing. So they, you know, as soon as you're transmitting the frequencies, okay, we had, we had a, a, a one radio that the guy just kept searching. All the, and when he picked up a radio station, you would look, you would have a list of stations, we, we, known stations. You'd pick it up, check. He says, okay, I know this one. This is this one. Okay, carry on going. And you know, and it depends how often you you transmit. You you just got to be lucky at that one specific time when the guy transmits something. And we picked up a couple of new sulfur sulfur frequencies, and as they were transmitting, we picked it up. And then the guy would say yes, yes, something. And then we'd we'd have somebody monitoring that frequency for two days or so. And as soon as somebody starts transmitting, obviously um, sulfur only used Morse code, and they were English, so that wasn't a problem. So they would write it down. And uh, then if, as soon as we pick up that this is a swapper, we'd hand it to the DF and then they would monitor it. Now, is it is it so that you, with Morse code, I mean, every operator, I understand, has his own unique way of click, click, clicking that thing. Now, would it be possible after a while for you guys to actually recognize a transmitter on the other side? Now, you see what happens when they, when they transmit. They also transmit saying, listen, this is... A, Two zero two one zero. So then you would know that this is that that camp sending to that camp. Now you wouldn't have a DF uh, on every single message, because some of them you already know where they are, but they would they would send where they're from to to where they're from. I I, I don't record uh, saying uh, this must be this person was he sending his messages a little bit differently to and somebody else. No, I don't I don't record that. I just I just we just knew they they were sending messages from. Came to head office to HQ. I know the Rhodesian Air Force had something called an art or something. It was a Dakota, I believe, with all sorts of aerials sticking out of it. 
And are you doing uh, airborne electronic warfare? They would also pick up signals. I do believe the South African Air Force had the same type of thing going with this worker. That's what we call these, what is it, DC-4 sort of in which we're flying around. Um, mm -hmm. Did you people ever work with him or was he just an enclosed I, group for you guys? I know the guys in, in Grootfontein, I think, went on uh, some opses into Angola. I know, but they uh, they weren't in the aer they weren't in uh, airplanes. They were on the back of buffles, and they had like a I don't know if they call it an opgas or something like a box on the back of a a vehicle that was a signal unit, and then they would go in with that thing. But uh, us from Mapacha, we never went into Zambia and all that. We we had a couple of bras on the Zambezi about about twenty k's uh, towards. Um, Mampelela Island towards uh, the, the east, there's a, a, an island called the uh, um, Epa Island. We used to call it Epa Island, but we used to go there sometimes and have a braai on the side, on the South African side. Yo, you know, now today you think how risky it was, eh? But those days where yeah, we'd go there, we'd have two magazines in our rifle, get there, have a bit of a braai, have a lot to drink, get the driver, obviously didn't drink. And then get back to Mapacha. We had a lot of, we had, because we did our four hours daily. The other, the rest of it was a lot of social time. We did, we had, we had camp duties in the morning. We had to make sure the camp was clean for an hour. We had class time. Class time is a half an hour before sunset, and half an hour after sunset, we'd have to go into the trenches. You did say to me that these intercepts, even in Moscow, it was uh, basically in English. No, the the, the Sopa in Zambia was it was all in English. Yes, the Khrushchev was all Portuguese. Well, most of it was it was all Fapla and they also had Sopa, but um, that's why all the Portuguese guys went to Khrushchev. But was this a, a high class English or just normal English or? No, it's normal, normal Z Zambian English and Swap English. It was nothing high class now. No. no. I became mm. friends with a colonel in the signals. We passed now, I'm sorry to say. And he told me a story about uh, some intercept at, at Zambia. Apparently, there was one policeman who wanted leave. So he asked for leave. And then... Uh, he didn't get his leave, and then a few days later, it was the signal went out to say that he's, he's AWOL, he's, he's gone somewhere. <laughs> Have you people ever picked up something like this, a storyline, or was it just individual here and there? No, 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 we picked up a lot of that, a lot of that, especially the the the, the Zam, Zambian Zampol, you know, Zambian police. They sent a lot of, they, yes, they sent lots of Morse code, and those guys really got good at Morse code. They, was this was all the time, and they were sending like, as I said, three thousand messages a month. It was crazy, and so and they got they monitoring two frequencies, two two Z Zambian police frequencies. So the, the, if you don't if you don't write your message down during your four hour shift, your your tape recorder is going all the time. So if you miss a message, you got to sit after your four hours. We got another. You had another thing called a wallen suck that you could put your tapes in there. And you can read it, you take your message and you write it down. So the better you get at your job, the less, the shorter your time is. So, you know, if you're really not good, you could work six, seven hours a day, you know. But uh, those guys really got good at Morse code because they were sending it like at 40, what they call 40 words a minute of two radios. And they would write, they could, they could accept, they could write it down, two messages down at the same time. It was crazy. But that, that reminds me, I mean, you talked about the guy with the one radio frequency here, the other one there. Doesn't his brain scramble? I mean, do you get physically <laughs> tired to, how do you do no, that? that? Yeah, those guys, they, 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 yeah, that one station was, was, was the worst. But no, they, you know what, you, you adapt, you get to use, you get used to it. And you, they could write it, they could write it down. And now every now and again, we'd monitor, because the ships also send Morse code, eh? But they, we used to try and write that down, but that's running at like 120 minute, words a minute. I think they've got a machine that deciphers it. Was they, the messages were, were right too quick for us. And and we and we were we got quite good at Morse code. I must tell you the way we, we, when we were at Furtaka Wurta doing our signals on top of the Furtaka monument, 
was a red light that used to flash. And we used to think, oh, you know, so I could just the normal, just flashing red light for airplanes. And then they came to us and said, look there, read that Morse code. It was actually Morse code, Ons for Yo, South Africa, in, in Morse code. Long, long light, short light, long light, everything. It was, it was amazing. Oh, that's fantastic. I mean, I wonder if he's still doing that. I actually don't know. I haven't been, I haven't been past the Fort Aka Monument at night for forever. But I, I, it, it would be interesting to know, hey? Yeah. Any legacy viewer, guys, if you're close to the Fort Aka Monument, on Cape Piki, take a video of this thing. And we'll, mm. or the flashing light will bring it to our guest here. And, or perhaps somebody, somebody can translate to us. But you know how many times Morse code actually came up? You know, in the, in the old Nokia's, when you had an SMS, it would go, dit, 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 da, da, dit, dit, dit. it's SMS in Morse code. And like uh, SAS, three shorts, three longs, three shorts. And uh, on your phones, when there was a message waiting, it would say message waiting in Morse code. It was, you, you think your phone's just beeping. But somebody who knows Morse code, you could actually listen to it carefully and you know, okay, that's what it's saying. So after all these years, you can still translate it or decode it. Yeah, I, I can. I'm a, I, I'd be slow. I'm, I'm slow because you know what? The, the alphabet, it, each, each, alf, each letter has got an alphabet and uh, I still know the alphabet. But uh, my mind's not set to uh, 13 words a minute anymore. So, but it, I, I promise if I had to do it, after probably a week or so, two no, not even probably two days, I'd get up to speed again. But I, I, I have to, I, you know, through my through my years, every time I come across Morse code, I try and decipher it. Now, when I, I've heard a story about the signalers. You know, all the all the units tell me that they were actually uh, really ladies' men, so to speak. You know, <laughs> the paratroopers will tell you that you know that parachute wings. Special forces will say there's nothing further to say. They arrived in top story. You know that type of thing. Panzers, well, you know, they smell of grease, but that's mainly. <laughs> did you people, any at any given stage, perhaps uh, send a Morse code message to your girlfriend and see if she responds or something like that? You, you, you know what? We were, we, were, we were told we're such a top secret uh, section that if you did anything, out of that normal. You weren't allowed anybody in that camp. You weren't allowed to transmit anything out. Uh, you, you, you'd go straight to DB. So, you know, we were just to take a film out from the camp. Yo, was people like, used to be really nervous. And uh, they never used to search our bags when we went back to the States and anything like that. So, but we, everybody was super nervous. We were, we had to sign like, uh, confidentiality clauses and things like that because uh, it was supposed to be, we were told it's against the Geneva Convention or something, you know, which was, I don't believe, but it was all doing it. But uh, we were we were really indoctrinated to say this is now really top secret. Even when guys, we used to play cricket against uh, uh, other units on our on our little base and they used to ask, what, what are these towers, all these towers doing here? And we just used to say, just sending messages back to the states. That's all. So we 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 were told it's top secret. We nobody contacted the woman. I must say the one day when I was doing my camp with the regiment Northern Natal, one of the guys' uh, wives had twins. Then we jumped onto the radio and we tried to contact somebody by a voice, and we got caught. So the uh, sergeant major. We were now 25 k from Amoni. He picked us up. He took us to Amoni, dropped us off outside the front gate of the Amoni and said, okay, now you're walking back to, to base. So we thought we'd be clever. We're going to take a shortcut. Was from Amoni, it was like a Z to our camp. And we walked through the felt. And we got, the half of us got so lost. Eventually, I got back to the road. I got a lift with one of the buffles. He took us to the back to the camp. And one guy got so horribly lost, we had to go and look for him that evening. I don't, I don't think that Sergeant Major will ever let, do that with us again. Yeah, well, it was a dreadful episode, not very far from um, Amione, where campers actually got killed. 
uh, but we decided we, we, we were not going to um, talk about it on legacy. And obviously not you guys, you, you, you survived this. Uh, but did you ever try to, to jam the enemy signals or interrupt them, or were you only listening, gathering intelligence? The only time we ever fiddled with an enemy signal was that day that uh, we, we got a guy by the name of Divis. He, 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 he was parade, so he thought he could do Morse code in any case. Uh, we got onto that thing and we sent a Morse code so we could find out where they were. But other than that, it was strictly forbidden because that we didn't want them to know we were monitoring them. So there's no ways we wanted to get onto their... Uh, they, we didn't want them to know that we're monitoring their frequencies. So we... You say clear of that. We were purely a monitoring station. Now, it, I know it's possible for, for radio waves. People say to me it's very logical and it's very scientific, which I'm not. I'm not scientific. But I do know they jump around and you can hear them sometimes further away than what you think. And I know this because I sat in a Casper very far away and I would listen to Radio 702. We just suddenly came onto our frequency. I don't even know. We're tuning around there, and next moment, this bloody liberals they come out. Even though mm. in the beginning of, of, of Radio 702, it was actually like a rock station or a pop music or something. Have you people ever tuned into the States to, to listen to some music, perhaps? Yeah, you see, you see what happens is, uh, I think they taught us that in, in uh, it signals that when it's cooler, the signals travel further. So, yeah, we would have, we, we did, we did, you know, we had super powerful radios and um, we would, we would tune into a, a music station now and again. Yeah, we definitely did. Especially the guys that are working night shift. You know, when you're working six to 12 or 12 to six, you're on for six hours. All you're doing is you're sitting in the middle of this room, monitoring 15 radios. They're all on loudspeaker. And immediately you can pick up if there's a message coming through. Very seldom did they, you know, send that time of the night. And then they put one of the, like the non-important radios on, on a music station and they would listen to that. Yeah. Yeah, we had, we had a, definitely did that. Now we know that five Ricky was running around there, or five one as they called them, as zero trucks, uh, same as the Sioux Scouts. Did you ever at any incline perhaps that the radios you're listening to from the enemy is perhaps not the enemy, but fine freaky? No, we only we only picked up you know what happened is this the search the search station when they searched, if they picked up a local a local uh, army, South African army, they would just go past it. They wouldn't we wouldn't we wouldn't they would have they would have picked it up, guaranteed. But uh we just carried on going until we found uh other ones, enemy ones. I know, they, uh, uh, yeah, that's, I know uh, from Mapacha, they used to fly supplies to um, Mpilela Island. So what happened was they used to, um, sometimes there was a chopper that went out and they offered us now and again a, a trip to go to Mpilela Island. So they, some guys did do that, but we never monitored our, the South African, South African army, we never did. Yeah, that brings me to a question, you know, it's actually a bloody noisy place in airfield. Especially with the Air Force around. Let me apologize to Fossey, <laughs> our uh, flight engineer here, who thinks that flying is magic and to over is divine and uh, all these type of things they say to me. But seriously, I mean, do you not wake up in the middle of the night and you hear just one hell of a noise and that means there's a helicopter or something coming in? No, you know what? When when that chopper took off in the middle of the night, you know there was problems somewhere because uh, they didn't normally fly at night, and especially that one ops that went to uh, Western Zambia. Maybe I don't know if you, somewhere along the way you're going to pick up that they had an ops into Western Zambia in 1980. That morning, that whole airport w was full of Dakotas and. Parabats, they were bursting. I tell you what, that's that Mapacha was full, and that morning. In the early hours of the morning, I, I, I guess about four o'clock or so, you just heard all those planes taking off, going into this ops, and uh, then then it woke us up. But other than that, when when there's a chopper, we knew there, when there's a, uh, an injury, we knew there was an injury, and uh, we we just sensed it. 
Yeah, I think General McGill Alexander might have spoken about that ops. Because the paratroopers were quite heavily involved in, in Zambia, uh, mm -hmm. doing their things there. But I can't remember that far back. If anybody knows here, just please leave a comment. Tell us about it. But now, how old were you people when this happened? 17, 18, 19? 18, 18, 19, yeah. 18, 19, yeah. Some some people were 17, some people were 20. It was all, all around that age. I think the eldest guy... Rob must have been about 23 or something like that. Uh, he he came on. Uh, I think he was he was probably the oldest guy for sure. And you know, some of the guys, because you, you're working four hours a day, some of the guys actually did uh, correspondence studies through UNISA. So they actually started their degrees, which was actually bloody excellent, I tell you. Yeah, that's fantastic. I mean, I... Um... It, it's hard to study while you while you're working, you know. So so if, if they could have done that under that conditions, we have to take our hats off. Which brings me to another thing. Forty days. Did you people had like a forty days bash there at, at the base? Yeah, we had, we had a bloody nice pub there. We, we we they built up a very nice pub, uh, and I'll send you a picture of it. It's. And uh, we had a big 40 days, I can tell you. What happened was, the, with, a, with about a month to go, maybe a bit more, about six weeks, the new intake actually came up. So what happened is the camp, the base, the camp was actually too small for everybody. So what happened is they moved, they, they kept about, I think about five or six people behind to, to hand over to the new, to the new, new guys. And we, uh, we, they moved us to a camp just north of Pretoria near Buchanan's Cliff. And, uh, uh, but you know, it, the last, the last full month of the army, everybody's going for interviews. And uh, so people were hardly in that camp. You know, if you just had an excuse to go home, you, had to, you could go home. They didn't know what to do with us. So they just posted us there to Buchanan's Cliff for the last month. At what stage in your army career are you allowed to have a moustache? like a real manier snore, or don't you ever have that luxury? Okay. There was one guy, Mark Wilgo, he had a beard. But he had, a, somehow his parents had had, a, had a, a letter from the doctor saying he had a skin skin condition and he had to have a beard. But the rest of us, we were all clean shaven. I don't, I don't remember anybody... I can't remember anybody having a moustache, but I, there might have been. I, I can't remember it. We were all clean shaven at, at the time. You see, my, my beard grew so little. I was really, I was one of those fortunate guys that I didn't have to shave every day. So I didn't have a, I, I had bum fluff on my, under my nose in those days. So I only grew my moustache after I left the army. Well, it's, it's a thing to have a beard in the forces, you know. As you say, you have to jump over papers or suffer from some real real uh, skin disease or whatever. I tried it myself. It never worked with me. Uh, but, I mean, at, at a base like that, do they have, like, uh, people who cut your hair or would you do it yourself or will they not that, that into that anymore? I mean, this is not basics. This is on the border. Yeah, we, we had a we had a clippers there. We had clippers, and uh, it was a big thing for us to put it put a number four on and just cut our hair down short. And um, I, I I don't I, I just I, I think if your hair got too long, the the the, the luti would tell you to cut your hair. Uh, we weren't allowed we weren't allowed long hair. You know, it it wasn't allowed. So your hair had to be neat and cut. So I don't record anybody having long hair but for us a big thing was now taking your mop of hair and leaving it at number four you know today this is number four you know it's it's nothing but in those days the number four was very short yeah you know it's a funny thing how, how uh, things have changed i recall in the 80s absolutely nobody wants to wear army boots or anything on their with their jeans i mean you just didn't do that and then later on 20 years later, it became like the, the, the murder, you know. People started wearing the semi-military stuff, and 
even today, I, I can see that people want these boots back and, and things like that. So, so you were not treated as uh, recruits or anything like that. They weren't like uh, oppies and things. Uh, you, you just didn't do your work. You, you just got up, eat, go to work, come up. Exactly that. You, you, had, you had different shifts. Obviously, like you had, an, let's say you had an afternoon shift today. Tomorrow you had a, a middle shift. The next day you had a morning shift. So your shift did move. But once you did your four year, uh, your four hours, and um, and that is six days a week. That was every day. And if you if you go, if we went for a bra at the at the Zambezi, you had to be on the morning shift. You could only go in the afternoon. But we didn't do a lot of that. We we probably did, I, I remember doing the Zambezi bra probably three times or so in in eighteen months. Um, we had we had a lot of bras at the on Saturday bras at the at the base. Uh, normally we uh, we uh, you we had a little unimog. We'd go to the central kitchen at Mapacha and get uh, our food, like in, in big bins, bring it back, and people would eat, and then you'd take it back after the, after the so that we had a chef in the in the base camp that would cook for us. Uh, obviously, we had tea and coffee and that sort of thing uh, at our side. And uh, yeah, so that was it. Now, there's not a lot of privacy in these tents and things. Um... That's the one thing about the forces which 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 you have to get used to is I mean you're never alone really. And even in your shower, there's normally about 10 guys with you. And uh, the old joke of don't bend down to pick up the, the soap. <laughs> that never happened with us, by the way. I want to know <laughs> if it's actually the truth. The point <laughs> I'm trying to make it is 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 for relaxation with you read the magazine or, or I mean there were nothing else, listen to music, perhaps play darts. Yo, I'll tell you one thing, Chris. If there's something I got very good at, was darts, table tennis, pool, and we. I, I was. I was. A, I was. I was. I enjoyed my sports. So whenever there was any chance of playing touch rugby or volleyball, we were there. We had a little gym there. We, myself and my buddy Gavin, we'd go to. We do quite a bit of gym work, and um, we had a, 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 run, a place to run around Mapacha. If you go just out of Mapacha, you actually ran almost out of the camp and around the camp into the airfield from the other side. And I think about every four or five months, there'd be a, there's a, there was a like a Mapacha to Katima marathon. I don't know if you remember it. There was a, some people did the whole 25 Ks and you could do 25 Ks, 5 Ks, you know, for a, a relay or, or 10 K, 10 K relay. And uh, I remember we we did the myself and a, one of the guys did a, a 10k. Really, we came third out of all those guys. Um, so we did a lot of. And the, what happened is, my I'm 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 a fair skin guy, so the sun's not scared of me. So I never lay in the sun a lot. But yo, some of those people when they were finished their four hour shift, they were in the sun. If I show you photos of of, of that camp, it's all people short pants. T-shirts. It looks like a holiday camp, but once you've done your four hours, they let you. They, you could do whatever you wanted. So, and and I couldn't. I that I was scared of the sun, so I I never did that. But I got good at ta- even darts today and uh, table tennis and all those those snooker. Yo, I, I got very good at that. Now, why touch rugby? What's wrong with normal rugby? I mean, that's why you play is to grab somebody and you know work him a bit. Yeah, but you know that sand and all that you said. You know, this it's just beach sand there, eh? So uh, we didn't. We we had a rugby team. We did play rugby. We played rugby against the air force. We played rugby at, at, in Katima. Katima had a rugby field, and we. I, I remember playing rugby against uh, the air force. I remember playing against um, Forsyth. Forsyth came into a, a, a base just outside Katima called Wanella, and we played against them. Uh, we played against them twice, actually. The first time we, we beat them, but they were saying, no, 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 half the guys are on patrol. So what happened is we played another game against them, and they hammered us. I can tell you, all those rugby players came back from patrol, and they, they <laughs> it was a totally different game. But it was quite nice because, you know, they invited us back to Wenella. I saw the base. 
uh, they invited us for a bribe, but we, you know, we we were supposed to be top secret people, so we we just hung around. They had a beer and went back to Mapacha. That the, that some other trip has ever approached you guys and said, "Look, seriously, no, but tell us what do you Nothing like that, or you know, I heard I heard a couple of years ago that somebody says he went into that camp, and I said, "No way." And then he explained that he, he one of his buddies was there, and they smuggled him into the camp, and he showed them this the the radio room, you know. But if if that guy who got him in there show, got caught, he was straight to DB. I can promise you, because I I, I think I think just the the, the frequencies. The, the, I think that was more important. Is what frequencies are you monitoring? I, I, I'm sure the enemy. New, like, I, I know you had an ops once where the where thirty two battalion was saying, "Listen, don't don't talk on this radio. They're listening to us in in um, in in uh, Bushman." And I'm sure uh, you know they just didn't want to know which which frequencies we 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 monitoring. So I think they had must have had an inkling. Because Swapper also didn't send a lot of messages. They sent short, sharp messages. So. Their, their radio, their, their, their frequency wasn't busy all the time. You know, like the Zambian people, they didn't worry. They sent all their messages, but Swapu was short and sweet. Okay, but what would Swapu say when they sent these messages? I mean, what, what's the normal, would they report their strength or, or they need food or what, what did they say to each other? Uh, it could be exactly that. They could say, listen, we need food, we need arms, we need this. Okay, we might be moving out or whatever, you know, like a sit trip. They used to call it sit trip, situation reports. And uh, they would just, but just very minimal. You know, I don't think they actually gave much uh, troop movements, but uh, they did, they would send food and say, okay, everything's fine, or this person's sick or whatever's happening. I can't, I can't recall in detail what those messages were anymore. But I know that one that one program of yours they did pick up that they were gonna, that, but that was a popular thing that where they were going to move um, tra- uh, arms from one camp to the other that I do know but I think that was a, that was a threat with them guys. Yeah, they were quite good actually, Swapu. I mean, the one thing which came out on Legacy is that Swapu was highly rated, respected as, as an enemy. Yeah, somehow somehow where we were after that seventy eight incident. Uh, at Katima, uh, and I know there was a, there was another incident where they shot uh, uh, hit a guy with an RPG between Mapacha and um, Katima, and your uh, one of your um, minister the the chaplain, he was talking about that as well the chaplain, and it was right it was just about four k's out of out of Mapacha or five k's out of Mapacha on the bend there, where they hit the guy with the RPG. But after that. I think I, the sector seventy was was fairly under control. Somewhere along the way, Zambia also I think kicked Swapo out of uh, out of Z- Western Zambia, and it was also around about there. I think you know because I mean we went we went camping on the Zambezi with, or not camping, drying. I mean right opposite the bloody Zambian border, uh, Zambian side. So no, I'll, uh, yeah, it was. I, it, I, although we got danger pay. You know, you got you got a certain danger pay. It was above a certain line in 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 uh, southwest. We got we managed to get that. So that was quite that was quite nice. Was that money? We we spent nothing. You know, we we'd have a couple of beers in the pub there, and other than that, we'd bank all that money. So when I got back to South Africa, people were buying cars, and I paid for my computer course and all that. So uh, that was quite a nice packet package to come back to. Yeah, I can tell you, I was there. We left just before that big attack on uh, Katima, but, but there were lots of incidents. There were things, uh, there were a few mortar attacks. There were all sorts of things going on. And then came, of course, the attack where the 10 guys unfortunately passed and the Duomini was talking about that, the chaplain, because he was there. Uh, very dramatic. And that was in revenge of, I think, the Kasinga attack, the paratrooper attack at Kasinga. So they knocked at uh, Katima, which is very far away from Katsingo. Uh, but after that, things quiet came quiet, you know, it calmed down. But 
what I'm saying to people is the following is, guys, you didn't really know that at that stage. I mean, the, the enemy could have come over the, uh, the Zambezi. They could have come back. They, it, it used to be a hot spot. In fact, that mm-hmm. is where the police got quite heavily involved with um, counterinsurgency right in the beginning when, when that area was was actually quite busy. So this, you have the same stress as the guy who was saying in a Wombolok in other sectors like one zero. Because you don't know if this guy is going to, you know, attack you or not. You still have to be for all. Yeah, yeah. No, no, I, 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 we were, I, we were, you know, but we did take risks, eh? I mean, that Amiga base was 150 Ks from us. And um, we had to, we went there, just myself and a driver in, in a Land Cruiser to fetch the guys that were going on leave. And it's 150 k's along that that Zambezi over the Kalangola River or whatever, and back. And it was dirt road, eh? So it was now it's tar road. So we could they could have planted a landmine and all that. We just took a took a bit of a risk. Now you guys who were there at the uh, Mopacha um, Air Base. Uh, did you ever meet these singing canaries or what do you call them? And those people who came to entertain the troops were they ever there? Yes. Yes, we did actually. We did. Eh? Yeah, we went to uh, Katima, and I, I, I don't know if it was Patricia Lewis or somebody came up there and sang for us. Um, I, I actually meant to mention. I actually wanted to mention that. Um, yeah, they, they not not often. I think we probably had about two or three of these where they would send these uh, these uh, civilians up, and they'd get us into an, an area. And uh, they would give us a show. Excellent, I must say. Excellent. You know, when, when, when I'm talking like this, it sounds like we went on to a holiday camp. Eh? Yes, if you see the pictures, it was... I, I've only got pictures of people in very short pants tanning and stuff like that. I haven't got people in browns and, you know, we, we had to have a brown shirt on. And uh, at least when we went on to duty. But we could go in short pants and slops. So we were in an air-conditioned room. And uh, so, yes, we had, a, we had a good time, I must say. You know, it was just a bit long. Two years was a long time. But uh, I, enjoyed the, I enjoyed the one year. Yeah, I'm wondering if you're not talking about Geraldine. But Irish Summer, also a blonde woman. Much prettier than this other one where you mentioned. Peter Senior as well. <laughs> she, she was there. Um, I don't know if there's any guys of you out here with saw Geraldine on the border, please contact me. I would like to know how that has been. And if you wonder why suddenly Brian's now sitting in a different place, man, it's a power, you know, ESCOM got us from behind again. And so we had to move to his battery pack. Brian, if there's uh, any words which you can say to your old people, your comrades, your, your friends, but I have somebody listening here who I haven't seen you in many years. Any words of advice? You know, of course, we've got a nice, uh, we've got a nice group, like a, a Facebook group that uh, that we on. And, and most of the people, a lot of the people are on there. So uh, there was like 50 people of us, 50 of us together for most of 18 months. You know, like we were part of the first lot, but there's some people that came a bit later. And uh, every now and again, I've got a friend coming out from New Zealand in September, and he's uh, he contacted me. He says, Brian, when, I, when I'm out here on holiday, I'm coming to see my in-laws. Let's get together. So we are more or less in contact with people. You know, I went down to Sedgefield, and I bumped into somebody that was with us. Uh, he was on this Facebook group, and I could see that he lived down there, and I'll go down there every year. And uh, so every now and again, if I'm in Cape Town, I'll get all of the people in Cape Town. When I'm in Durban, I get all of the people in Durban. It's like a com- camaraderie that we still got going. And, and that's where both, some of the photos I'm going to send you are, aren't my pictures, are pictures from these, these, these colleagues of mine or these comrades of mine, they, whatever they are. And, uh, and some of them, like the, I'll just go over it was involved with Smoke Shell. I was, I was gobsmacked. It was only after, it's only now that I'm watching all these legacy programs do I pick up this whole Smoke Shell. And yeah, he's, he was involved with it and he was probably two radios down from me. You know, at the time we were, we were more worried about playing touch rugby and soccer and all this than whatever you did on your radio, you know? 
Yeah, I mean, I suppose you couldn't really speak to each other that much anyway. I mean, with the guy, it's still secret. It's even secret amongst you people. But I'm glad that you, that you all have met up again. I mean, that must have been a great feeling to, to see these guys after all these years again. Yeah, we always talk about the reunion, but it never happens. You know, we we meeting we meeting each other individually. Okay, I have to say now to the internet and to you as well. Since uh, the power went off, the reception isn't that good. <laughs> it's like two out of five. So so we'll have to look it here, and I have to say to all of you guys out there, man, come and speak to us. Uh, thank you, Brian. I really enjoyed this episode. And I uh, wish more people would just contact me. Come and tell your story, guys. It doesn't matter if you were not in a rattle at a uh, smoke shell or wherever. You all have a story. We all are proud of you. We're proud of you guys for what you've done, how you contributed, didn't run away. And uh, we respect that. So thank you to all of you. And until we meet again, God bless. Okay, cheers. Thanks, Chris. What I'll do is I'll put this link on, on, on our group and then... Uh... Maybe we'll get a couple other guys also talking.